Bethel family, uh, local, global, I guess it all merges uh, in this season. Um, hopefully we will be back together locally here in this building soon. I am I'm almost ready to start holding my breath in anticipation because I can, I can just, I can feel it. I can feel it coming. Um, today is the third and final week on the uh, series that we're doing on Reformation. Um, man, I'd love to visit it again. It's, I'm so, I was so uh, encouraged when, uh, towards the beginning of the year, Eric told me the different series that we'd be doing throughout the year. And one of my most favorite subjects on the planet is the subject of Reformation. I, years ago, I, <clears throat> I, I kind of was talking to friends and, and uh, told them I, I really had, uh, you know, I had so much interest in the subject of Reformation. I don't remember how it happened. I, 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 th- I know one thing that happened is Stacy Campbell was here and uh, she gave uh, me a prophetic word up in our upper room. Uh, in the green room during uh, one of our conferences, and she prophesied over me for, I don't know, maybe five or ten minutes. It was a very, very moving and uh, compelling word for me. And it was, uh, it had its roots in the concept of reformation and what God had done in Geneva, uh, specifically through Calvin and a bunch of guys. Uh, They just, basically, they believed that the Bible had answers for every one of man's dilemmas, problems, issues in life. And bringing a culture back to biblical, biblically divine, defined values was in many ways the heart of that Reformation. So anyway, I, I remember uh, just saying, oh man, I, I need to, you know, I go to Switzerland, I need to just go to Geneva sometime and, and, uh, and just, uh, uh, just research, just you know, travel around the city and try to, try to get some sense, feel for the subject of Reformation. And uh, long story short, uh, some dear friends, uh, now very dear friends of ours, uh, Bedros and uh, Rebecca, um, lead a a wonderful ministry there. And they, uh, Bedros reached out to me and he said, listen, if you come to, if you come to Switzerland, I'll pick you up, bring you to Geneva, and which he ended up doing and just drove me around the city, Benny and I around the city for uh, a couple days as we just would visit Reformation sites and the museum and read the stories and it was just moving. I, I, I believe every move of God has in its basic, um, in the seed of every move of God carries the potential for a reformation. Every visitation of God to me carries the possibility, the potential of revival that is not supposed to end until there's true reformation of culture, society. And it's just, it's just a huge subject. It's not something that I, I feel qualified to, uh, to deal with in any, uh, any, uh, great, with any great success today, but I will touch on it. But it, having said all of that, as I have been thinking, praying towards, looking forward to this opportunity to be able to talk to you about this, a favorite subject of mine, I have, I have felt the dealings of the Lord. I don't use that that kind of terminology with you very often. But I have, over recent weeks, been feeling the dealings of the Lord on our need, our need as a people, a movement, but as a nation. Yeah. Our need to return to the basics, the fundamentals. And I, I want to read to you a verse that many of you can quote, but I want to read. I actually have quite a few scriptures written down on paper, so I won't have to Uh, necessarily turn to each because I I really want to try to use the time well. I'll give you the reference. But this first one where I want to start today, it's not the portion we're going to study, but it's the part that I want to start today, is 2 Chronicles 7.14. I want you to listen carefully. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let me read it again. If my people who are called by my name, we keep waiting for the world to repent when God is saying the healing of the land is dependent upon my people repenting. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This profound picture is of the wonderful union between Jesus and his people where in this passage, the sin, the rebellions, the independence, the attitudes, the, all the, you know, the wrong values, all the junk gets removed and that fellowship becomes so tender and so dear that it overflows into the healing of the earth itself. For me, it's the beginning place of all true reformation. And let me, let me just put it this way. Repentance is at the heart and soul of every great move of God. It's at the heart and soul because God will actually put his blessing on an unbeliever before he'll put his blessing on a carnal believer. The scripture says that blessing is God's calling card. He will actually touch an unbeliever with his favor and his blessing, hoping that they will want more of that and turn their hearts to seek him. It's very clear in scripture, but it's also clear that judgment has to begin with the household of God first. Why is that? If it starts with the world, it requires condemnation. If it starts with the church, it makes us pure, which enables us to bring more people into the kingdom. It must start with you and with me. Repentance is at the heart of this thing. Repentance, the absolute turning from every known thing that would defile or compromise our values, our lifestyles, the focus of our life. For many years, I've, I have emphasized the true meaning of the word repentance, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not sorry for, for that at all. The, the word repentance means to change the way you think, change your mind about something. And I believe in that very strongly, because it, when I was growing up, it was, not, uh, it was not an emphasized part of repentance. The crying at the altar was the emphasized part. And here I want to make a, not a mid-course correction, but I want to add something to our definition. First of all, repentance is the changing of the way you think. But the Bible says, godly sorrow leads to repentance. Godly sorrow. There is the place for deep internal remorse for everything that has defiled us or has caused us to be off course. It's not living in regret. It's not living in regret over things that Jesus has forgiven. It's not that. It's just the, the absolute realization that I am alive because of the mercy of God. Yeah. And we're going to look at a couple stories today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to weave some very large stories into a very small period of time and see if we can help to make sense of this journey that we find through scripture on how God extends his mercy to a group of people and he heals their relationships, their relationship with him, families, all of that get healed. But the land itself, the, the earth, the, the agriculture, the political systems, the educational systems, everything about community life starts to come into place. And I would like to suggest that that kind of repentance right there is the seed of a great reformation. And I believe that the Lord is actually, we're, it, we're, we're living at a time with obviously the pandemic, the political stuff. We, we've got so many things that are hanging in the balance that if there was one word that I could talk to every believer in our country, and I know we have so many other nations uh, that are participating in this service, and I would encourage you to take this to heart as well. But if there's one verse I could give to every born again person in this nation, it would be 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people. And I would say, look at me, guys. Listen to me. Live this as full as you possibly can. Because we have right now, we have things that will affect multiple generations ahead, hanging in the balance right now. And what we've got to have is a visitation of God. We've got to have an invasion of the Almighty One who would come in and among us and bring healing, and it's always to places we don't deserve. So that's, that's kind of where I want to start today. I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, read a verse out of the book of Ezekiel, if you want to turn there with me. Most of these references I'm just going to uh, just give to you quickly, and then... Uh, 
and then read it off the paper that I, I have printed out. But here's a verse. I want to talk to you about three different cities. I want to talk to you about Sodom, Gomorrah, and Nineveh. All three cities had the absolute judgment of God pronounced towards them. Now, I realize the judgment of God is not a very popular subject, but get used to it. It's still in the Bible, and he didn't take off his judge hat when he became savior. Um, if I can put it this way, if you were to have discovered cancer in your body, you would not want to go to a doctor that believed that cancer should have its own free life and its own free expression. You would want a doctor that would bring judgment on that which is working to destroy your life. And in the same way, we want the mercy of God on our lives, but the judgment of God that cuts off everything that wars against our own destiny. Mike Bickle says it best. He says, God's judgments are always aimed at whatever interferes with love. God's judgments are always aimed at whatever interferes with love. And so it's something that we want as blood-washed saints, as those who are have given ourselves to live, to follow, to serve Jesus, to honor him with our whole life. The judgment of God is the very thing that we need and is very sobering. And right now we need a heavy, heavy dose of the fear of God uh, released into our nation. So here, let me read to you. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Nineveh was spared. And we're going to just try to take a real quick look, if we can, at these uh, three cities. Out of Ezekiel chapter, did I tell you the chapter 16? Chapter 16, verse 49 This is a very, very sobering verse. Uh, I want to remind you, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. it's, It's a cultural phenomenon. People who don't read the Bible know about Sodom and Gomorrah and why they were destroyed. They were destroyed for their immorality. They were destroyed for their gross, gross perversion sexually and so many other things that had become a part of their, excuse me, ongoing lifestyle. But here in Ezekiel 16, verse 49, it says, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Abundance of food, spare time, and it wasn't used for the poor and the needy. I would like to suggest to you that abundance in our life has to find expression through compassion or it will be misused and abused. It has to find release through compassion. The Pharisees uh, would complain to Jesus because he would heal on the Sabbath day. What was missing? The compassion for the paralytic who had no use of his arm. That's what was missing. They were more concerned about keeping the rules than they were somebody being set free. It's over and over and over again. The complete absence of compassion is what caused them to be so blind so blind to their own heart's condition, so blind to the cries, the needs of the people around them, that they they completely severed their hearts from being moved by this divine expression called compassion. We see Peter and John are walking to the gate beautiful. And there's a lame man there. And Peter looks at him and he In Acts chapter 3, he says, uh, he's there begging for for money. And Peter says, I I don't, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I give to you. Catch that. What I have, I give to you. Just follow me on this this uh, this, this little logical journey here. What I have, I give to you. Many people don't function in the miraculous because they don't know what they have. Let's say that I had $10,000 cash in my pocket and I go downtown and I've got all these, I've uh, got $100, $100 bills here, I've got all this money here in my pockets and I walk past a, somebody asking for food. First of all, if I have surplus money and I do nothing, then I obviously am not moved with compassion. And I hear all the time, well, we don't want them to go buy drugs or alcohol or whatever. I get that, 
But there's another issue. I can't use their misuse as my excuse to do nothing. The possibility of them sinning with what I give them cannot keep me from what I need most, and that is to move in compassion, to do something to contribute to their life. Now, let's change the story a little bit. Let's say that $10,000, every time I pull a $100 bill out, it gets replaced. It's a supernatural thing. No matter how much I give away, it gets replaced. That actually is a better description of what it is to minister in the anointing. Because you don't release anointing and power in a miracle setting and lose something. It is always replenished. It is unending supply. The reason miracles are supposed to be a regular part of our life is because they actually express the compassion of God. You and I can show compassion by showing sympathy. And and I don't want to say any of these things are bad. I'm just saying biblical compassion leads to a solution. Sympathy leads to comfort in a problem, but not a solution. And I believe that the Lord would heighten our awareness right now of something that actually was at the foundation of the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah, is that they had all these perversions and these things that developed out of their surplus time, surplus money, surplus food, and the absence of compassion, they developed into a self-seeking culture, which sounds a whole lot like a place I'm very familiar with that we all live in surplus time, surplus money, and I realize that's not everybody, but as a culture, what happens when you have extra and it's not directed towards serving the needs of people around you is we become insulated and isolated from world need. If I walk past the person and I didn't do something, you could say I was not moved with compassion, but here's the deal. Jesus announced the spirit of the Lord God is upon me to release captives, to open the eyes of the blind. What, is it, what did he do? He declared his realization that he had what was needed by that blind person. He had what was needed by that lame person. Yeah. I, don't know if, I hope this is making sense. That when you, when you are aware of what you have, and it's what, it's what Peter said to the lame man. He says, such as I have, I give you. He knew he carried an eternal flame, if you will. Sorry, I, I need to cough here. It's not COVID. <laughs> I promise, it is not COVID. It was a tickle in my throat, leave me alone. All right, I'm, I'm teasing you. All right, so here's this, here's this um, the compulsion to give out of what you have. I believe we know that authority comes in our lives through the commission. It's our yielding to what God has commanded us to do, but power comes in the encounter. This is why, this is why, encounters with God are so essential because they cause you to be aware of what you have. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just reading a verse and claiming it. I, I believe in that and I, I, I try to practice. A huge part of my life is that. It's, it's finding what God says in his word and come before him in prayer and just contend until there's breakthrough. I believe in that. But I'm just telling you right now, we need the kind of encounters that are unexplainable, unreasonable, unmanageable, outside of our control, so that we come face to face with the fact that God is upon me and I am impacted by him who has no limitation. He has no boundaries. He has no restrictions or restraints, except in some measure, my willingness to cooperate with him. Obviously he can do whatever he wants, but you get the picture. He primarily flows through yielded people. And when we don't yield, when we look at the problem as an impossibility and don't think in terms of what I have, what I have, I give to you. Peter gave something that he didn't have in and of himself, and that was the capacity to walk given to a lame man. Here's here's the, the story. Sodom and Gomorrah, abundance, time, and needs. Only two of those things mattered to them was the abundance and the time, the excess time, not the needy people. And because of that, that 
brokenness in how we do life as a culture, as a society, actually became a wide open door for the demonic to come in and create a playground of absolute perversion, but it started with excess that wasn't directed towards helping, serving, loving people. And I'd like to suggest that whether it's Sodom and Gomorrah or it's the Pharisees with religious institutions and organizations, both have the absolute same corruption at its core. It's the absence of compassion and the absence of of real heart for people. Jonah is is a personal favorite of, of mine. I I'm, I'm working on a book right now, and, and I, I just this last week was writing about Jonah. Now I've I've had this in mind for a while. I, it feels like it feels like maybe one of the most underrated miracles in the entire Bible is the healing of a city called Nineveh. If if you want an example of reformation, if you want an example of repentance that becomes the seedbed of a transformation of society itself, look no further than the story of Jonah and Nineveh. God speaks to this prophet Jonah, tells him to go on to preach. And interestingly, he, he doesn't tell Jonah, go and tell them unless they repent, they will be destroyed. He said, just go tell them, I'm going to destroy them. There was no offer of repentance. There was no promise. There was nothing given, just the announcement. Jonah, of course, uh, flees from the presence of God. Uh, This is weird. Nineveh repents. Jonah runs from the presence of God. Uh, uh, I'll get to it in a minute. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I can feel it. This story... Jonah has the assignment to go to Nineveh, walk the streets, repent. He runs from the presence of God, gets on a boat, thrown overboard to save everybody on the, on the boat, which is an interesting comparison. The entire boat that Paul was on in the book of Acts, everybody was spared because he was there, but everybody just about died because Jonah was in this one. They throw him overboard. He's swallowed by a fish. <clears throat> he remembers the Lord, which is probably a good idea if you ever get eaten by a fish. <clears throat> and he, uh, he, he repents. And uh, the fish pukes him up on the beach, which if you can imagine sunbathing on the beach the day that a man is barfed in your presence. You probably would listen to something he had to say, I'm not sure. But anyway, he walks the streets. It takes him three full days, if I remember right, to walk the street, to, to walk from one end of the city to the other, announcing judgment is coming in 30 days or whatever. Word gets all the way to the king, and they announce that they're going to repent and see if by chance God might have mercy on them. And, and they do. They repent. I mean, from the greatest to the least, they all wore sackcloth and ashes. They, they literally sat in, in, in an ash heap. They, they're, they're in their, their mourning place. They even required the animals to fast. That's, that's just bizarre. It's such a deep sense of judgment coming upon them that they deserved. There was such clarity in their thinking that their repentance was not a casual, oh God, forgive me for that. That was a, that was a real bummer. I'm, I'm sorry. It wasn't that. The deeper the sin into who you are, the deeper the repentance needs to be, not to earn forgiveness somehow, but to know that you're actually dealing with something that must be permanently uprooted from our life. And the mercy of God, of course, comes as they are bowing in repentance. And for days, they're in this place of repenting before the Lord. And, uh, and God shows up and he forgives them. Meanwhile, Jonah is sitting up on a hill waiting for the judgment of God to come on this city. And, uh, and he's, he's angry that God forgives him. And you know, I'll let you read the story, but it's, he's angry because God showed mercy. He said, this is why I didn't want to do it. This is why I didn't want to do it, because I knew you'd just have mercy on him. Because somehow it would make him look bad announcing judgment, I guess, and it not happening. A lot of ministry gets perverted when we are more concerned about how we appear than how we reveal God. 
And so Jonah in this situation, he's bummed out, he's sitting on a hill and a weird thing happens. He's got the sun just baking him and uh, he's waiting for judgment. It doesn't happen. A plant grows up overnight and it's shade for him. And the next day that plant dies at night. Here's, here's, here's what it says. Let me just read these scriptures to you. <clears throat> it says, uh, when God saw their deeds, this is in, um, oh goodness, I thought I wrote down, I didn't write down the reference. It's in the Bible. Oh, it's, here it is. It's in Jonah 3, verse, chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked ways. Now, please understand, confession must include turning from and turning towards. That's the concept of scripture. Uh, Hebrews 6 says repentance from dead works, faith towards God. So there's a from and there's a towards. He saw their deeds. They turned from their wicked ways. Then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them and he did not do it. And so in the next, uh, the next passage, which is in chapter four, verses 10 and 11 of Jonah, says, then the Lord said, now the Lord is rebuking Jonah and you gotta catch this part. The Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals? This is a bizarre passage. I, I, I want you to catch this. Jonah is shaded by a plant. He goes to sleep that night. The thing dies as quickly as it grew. It was, he was being protected. God interprets that not as, oh, you're mad you don't have shade anymore. God interprets it as you had more compassion for a plant that died in your presence than you do for a city of people who are so morally, ethically twisted that they, spiritually speaking, don't know the difference from the right hand to their left. They couldn't find themselves their way out of a wet paper bag. They are so lost in their moral condition that they couldn't find their way into a place of sanity unless the mercy of God came upon them. So God announces, Jonah, your issue is the absence of compassion. The absence of compassion. So here's this story about Nineveh. We see uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed And um, uh, because of their sin, God uh, announced he was going to bring destruction on uh, Nineveh, and he did not. Why? Because he had compassion. Now, here's the the deal that concerns me. Jonah was fine with the compassion of the Lord when it was for him. He ran from God, swallowed by a fish, puked up on the land, and he was great with the compassion of the Lord when it was directed towards him. But he was not happy with the compassion of the Lord when it was directed towards those Jonah wanted to see judged for their sin. I see this, I see this in, in Christianity, I see this in our world, where people will love the standard of mercy when it's extended to them, but they get very frustrated when that standard of mercy is extended towards others. It's, it's, it's a blind spot. It's actually a blind spot. It's a blind spot that almost, it's almost like it says, my deep repentance earned me that mercy, but I don't believe they've deeply repented. It's the judgment of the heart. And the judgment of the heart of another person is one of the most out of the line activities a believer can be involved in because the scripture says no one can know the heart unless God reveal it. And he doesn't reveal the heart of another person to you if you're going to criticize them. He only gives revelation to those he can trust with what he shows them. You cannot know your own heart. How in the world are you going to know somebody else's? And when this, this kind of stuff happens, somebody extends mercy, extends kindness. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so thankful you were patient with me. I'm so thankful you were kind to me. But when that same kindness is shown to somebody else, it's considered careless. Just no standards. I remember we had a, a fallen leader come to one of our events. 
We've had it several times, but I'm thinking of one in particular. And when he came, I introduced him to the crowd because everybody, everybody knows, everybody knows just his stupid mistakes, stupid sins. No excuse, but there is forgiveness. When I introduced him, he got a standing ovation, which I interpreted as we forgive you, we accept you, we want to give you room to repent and deal with your stuff. But the critics in the room took as an indication that we were soft on sin. I'm guessing that was Jonah's thought towards God, you're soft on sin. These people deserve judgment. There's not very many things that I could emphasize today that would be more pertinent to the hour that we live in than this right here. The mercy I've received, I must give away. I must give away. The man who was forgiven of a great, great, uh, I forget the numbers now, but you know, he owes millions of dollars and the guy forgave him and then he turned and he was angry at somebody who owed him $20. And the man who had forgiven him millions took back his forgiveness and brought judgment on him. The only part I want to say is when you've received something, I would like to suggest to you, Jonah, the prophet of the Lord, who knows the voice of the Lord, who knows the presence of the Lord, who ran from God in that moment created a bigger sin than Nineveh who didn't know their right hand from their left. And when God extended mercy to Jonah, the man of God who fled from his presence unwilling to do his will, that was the greater sin, at least in my thinking, than a city that didn't even know how lost they were. I I don't want to put graduated levels of sin. I just want to say God had mercy on the greater sin. And the problem is when, when you are raised in a church environment, when you grow up in this kind of environment, which many of you watching have been, we, we deal lightly with our sins of jealousy, our sins that accuse and point, our sins of easily being offended. We deal lightly with those and are so harsh towards those who have the quote-unquote greater sins, the moral failures, etc. And this is is a time as we come into a holiday season to celebrate the gift of God's mercy in Jesus. This is a time when it would be really smart for every one of us to realize I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. I remember I was in another city doing a conference and this pastor and all were leaving to go out to lunch and there was a woman still standing there. She was the only one left at the altar praying. Pastor said, asked if I'd take a moment. So I I went over and I began to pray. It's a a long story. I'm just going to cut it short. She basically didn't want me to pray for her, which is fine for me because I was hungry for lunch. I wanted to go with the pastor. But but I, I had this compassion thing that stirred up on me that that was at a different level. It really was. It's outside of my norm. She didn't want me to pray for her. She wanted her husband to pray for her, which generally I just tell somebody, you know, I have no problem with that. I don't have to be the one and we'll just move on. And then as I started to pray for her anyway, because I, I felt I was supposed to, I said, do you need to forgive anyone? And she said, you don't know what they've done for me. I go, oh, super. So now I got someone who doesn't want me to pray for them, number one. Number two, they are bitter and they're unwilling to forgive. And she was absolutely unwilling to forgive. Now, 99.9% of the time when I'm faced with that, I just, I basically say, listen, you'll you'll have to work this out because there's no freedom for you until you forgive. But that compassion thing stirred up again. And it was operating outside of my, my norm, the way I would normally think. I, I, need, I need her to face the difficulty of her choice to live in unforgiveness, that this calamity that she is facing is connected to. But it rose up in me again, and I bypassed all my rules, my personal boundaries. I bypassed all of them. I put my hand on her 
uh, the shoulder that was injured. And I just began to pray very simply. I said, all right, now move it around. She moved it. First of all, she was completely healed. As she began to move, she broke into sobbing, fell to her knees and said, I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. And that's what we need right now is a whole bunch of I didn't deserve it stuff going on. I just didn't deserve it. And repentance happened before me on the floor because I was, in some way <clears throat> I was willing to move beyond my, my prescribed boundaries that are biblically based and follow compassion to where compassion would lead me. She was healed and she repented of the resentment. My mind turned quickly to Matthew, and there's a portion of scripture I've taught on a number of times. A number of you, I'm sure, have heard me teach on out of Matthew chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 12. And if if I had this to do over again, I might spend the entire time just in Matthew 11 or 12. But in this chapter, Jesus talks about three cities, and I'll read it to you quickly. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty one, what do you Chorazin, what do you Bethsaida? If the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? Uh, New King James says, uh, you are exalted to heaven. So they're heaven-like in atmosphere. You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Now hear this, Sodom, I I said we're talking about Sodom, Gomorrah, and Nineveh. Nineveh was spared. Here Jesus gives an insight as to how even the perverted, horrible, twisted, distorted city of Sodom and Gomorrah could have been spared. And he says, if the miracles that were done in you, Capernaum, the religious community that is comfortable in living in biblical parameters, but you don't move in repentance. You don't move into a place where you recognize what God is doing is the only thing worth being involved in. You just add him to your nice cushion lifestyle. And he says, if the miracles that were done in Eucharist were done in Sodom, Sodom would still be here. What does that tell us? It tells us there's something about, I, I want to say it's the miracles. I want to say it's the abrupt invasion of the God of the impossible coming into people's lives. It is that and more. But let me suggest that the miracles of Jesus all came from that place called compassion. Let's re- restep this. Aware, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Why? To redeem, to bring healing, to restore. Now, he steps into a place where there's great need and he ministers out of what he has. What brought the release? The compassion. And Jesus was moved with compassion and the person's eyes were opened or the lame walked, whatever it might be. At a time that we live in right now where Emotions are at a heightened uh, area level for everything. It's it's. I've never seen a time when people are more easily offended. Yeah. And I'll tell you the scary thing about offense. And I I, uh, I have to examine this in my own heart, in my own life right now. I, I'm aware that when you discern something in somebody else, it's often because it exists in you, and you're not willing to recognize it. The spirit of offense deadens a person's ability to discern while at the same time heightening their awareness for the need of discernment. Offense clouds, perverts, distorts a person's ability to discern what's happening in another person. If I move with offense, I will misread and misdiagnose most every relationship I'm in. If I'm governed by offense, my own ability to discern, but what's crazy 
is my passion for discernment increases and I don't know where I'm blind. And because I don't know where I'm blind and the passion for discernment, it means that my discernment now is misdiagnosed and, uh, and usually brings destruction and not clarity, not liberty, not freedom. It is good. This past passage in Matthew 11, Jesus gives the insight to how sin-filled cities can be turned. It's through miracle signs and wonders. Specifically, it's the release of compassion that brings a company of people to the streets that know what they have. And every hundred dollar bill they give away, so to speak, is immediately replaced because the Spirit is given to us without measure. One more passage I want to read to you. It's, this is <clears throat> typically what I refer to. It's the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> In this chapter, a paralytic is healed. Then a crowd gathers. Everyone in the crowd is healed. Then a blind and mute man is brought to Jesus and he is healed. And then it says in verse 38, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. It's one of the weirdest stories, sequence of stories in the Bible for me. Miracle, miracle, Miracle. We want to see a sign from you. Then we want to see a sign from you. What's the point? The war is between signs that come from compassion and signs that elevate my own esteem and my own sense of control. The Pharisees, as always, want to dictate what happens. And they want Jesus to perform tricks for them when Jesus refused to perform for them, especially since he had just done these series of miracles that brought healing and deliverance to people and they went unrecognized by the Pharisaical crowd. What's the point? They were not moved with compassion. They are in the exact place as Sodom and Gomorrah was in that time of judgment because they didn't use their surplus towards serving and helping and redeeming. So here's this verse is used often against those of us who pray for the sick. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to this group, he says, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. No sign will be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet. It is an absolute abuse of scripture, the heart and the context of scripture to assume that Jesus is rebuking people that are pursuing miracles. It's an absolute abuse. It's in the context. It's a violation of reason. What he refused to do is put them in charge where they could dictate the showmanship of the hour. And instead he withheld. And he said this. He said, no sign will be given to you. That's a very specific group of people. You will not receive any sign except the sign of Jonah. I've always thought three days in the belly of the fish come out, the resurrection was the sign, and it may be. But in my reading today, it stood out to me that Jesus followed this statement with verse 41, and he said, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What's the sign of Jonah? I'm wondering if it's not the absolute raw preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The raw preaching where God himself shows up. He puts his hand on a message that releases the opportunity for the transformation of a life. If it might not be that this group of people will not see miracles anymore, all they will have is the opportunity to repent because they have heard a message that comes forth with the force and the power of heaven to transform a life. There's something unmistakable in this message that Jesus brought to people. Unmistakable in that he always provides people a way to enter life and to avoid 
uh, damnation, credit, uh, uh, a condemnation, uh, tragedy. He gives access to life, to breakthrough, to becoming all that God designed for us to become. All of his disciplines, none of them are for punishment. They're always to refine our focus so that we enter more fully into life, enter more fully into who we were designed to be. I believe that the testimony of Scripture is that we have a sense of indebtedness as believers. Number one, to get, to be, to get filled with the Spirit of God until we are conscious of what we have. Silver and gold have I none, but here's what I do have. Get up out of the wheelchair and walk. The burning conviction that what I have is greater than the problem you have. And I'm going to make an exchange with her. I'm going to give you a gift. It's a bizarre situation. <clears throat> that what the Lord is looking for is for you, for me, to number one, become aware of the God who is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Number two, allow his heart to bring us to that place of compassion, yieldedness, so that the gifts of the Spirit move in the context of love, not in showmanship, not in we want a bigger crowd, not any of that stuff. It's the simple gospel that changes a person's life. The greatest miracle is the conversion of a soul. The greatest miracle but it does not stop there. It's to heal the body. It's to bring deliverance from the torment that exists on the mind, on the family line. All these things were to be dealt with with the gospel of power. And that's what you have. That's what I have is a gospel of power. It is unlimited in its scope, in its measure, in its ability to not only restore everyone watching this to a place of friendship with God, restored as a child to a loving father, but also to the point where he heals our land. And right now we need the healing of the land. I'm gonna close in prayer, but I wanna ask all of you that are watching, if you find yourself outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then I want you on the Bethel TV, on YouTube channel, podcast, whatever means you are uh, by which you're watching this broadcast. Let somebody know, I need, I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. Somebody will pray with you. They'll talk with you, pray with you. Let me just close in prayer. Father, I thank you that we actually are on the edge of what could be the greatest reformation in all of history, all of history. We acknowledge that that is the purpose of the gospel, is to transform a life, a family, a nation, a world. And I'm asking that in this season, regardless of the abundance in our life in this season or the lack, that we would never lack compassion and that you would flow in and through us to bring healing to the land. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you.